Hello! In this lecture, we'll learn how we measure the distances to galaxies. We'll also see how Edwin Hubble proved that galaxies are distant objects far beyond the Milky Way and why he has a law named after him, Hubble's Law. Less than a century ago, we did not know the distances of even the nearest galaxies. There was debate to whether galaxies existed beyond the Milky Way. Discovering ways to measure distances to the farthest celestial objects led to a paradigm shift in our understanding of the universe. This is our problem, summed up here. Brightness alone does not provide enough information to measure the distance to an object. A bright star could be bright because it's nearby, or it could be bright because it's intrinsically luminous. To determine astronomical distances, we depend on a chain of methods in which each step allows us to measure greater distances in the universe. We've already discussed using stellar parallax to measure distances to nearby stars. Measuring parallax requires the precise Sun-Earth distance, the astronomical unit. Astronomers measure the astronomical unit via radar ranging. In this method, radio waves are transmitted from the Earth and bounced off of Venus. The round-trip travel time allows us to calculate Venus's distance from Earth, and from that we can work out the length of an astronomical unit. Therefore, radar ranging measurements of the astronomical unit represent the first link in the distance chain, and parallax measurements of distances to nearby stars represent the second link. Once we have measured distances to nearby stars using parallax, we can begin to measure distances to other stars in the same way that we might estimate the distance to a street lamp at night. If the street lamp does not look very bright, it's probably far away. If it looks bright, it's probably close. We can measure the apparent brightness of a street lamp. Then if we know how intrinsically bright each lamp is, say for example, 1000 watts, we can use the inverse square law to calculate the distance. We can use this technique to measure the distance to any object with a known luminosity. Astronomers call such objects standard candles. An astronomical object can be a standard candle only if we have some way of knowing its true luminosity. Unfortunately, most astronomical objects are not marked with a wattage label. A main sequence star is one example of a standard candle. Consider our sun. Any star that is also a main sequence star with the same spectral type, G2, should have about the same luminosity as the Sun. We can measure the star's apparent brightness and then use the inverse square law to calculate its distance. Because we can infer the luminosity of a main sequence star of a particular temperature, we can use a technique called main sequence fitting to measure the distance to star clusters that are too far to measure with parallax. Consider two clusters, the Hyades and the Pleiades. We know the distance to the Hyades from parallax, but we don't know the distance to the Pleiades. If we can measure the apparent brightness of both clusters and see that a star of a particular temperature in the main sequence of the Hyades appears seven and a half times brighter than a star of the same temperature in the Pleiades, we can then use this information to scale the stars of the Pleiades to the stars of the Hyades and learn their true luminosities. Then the inverse square law allows us to calculate the distance. The brighter the standard candle, the greater the distance we can measure. One of the most useful standard candles is a special type of extremely luminous variable star called a Cepheid variable. The period of pulsation of a Cepheid variable is related to its luminosity. When the Cepheid variable grows in size, it's at its most luminous. When the Cepheid variable shrinks in size, it's at its least luminous.
The period is defined as the time it takes for the Cepheid variable to go through one cycle, bright to dim and back to bright. Cepheids can have periods ranging from a few days to a few months. In 1912, Henrietta Leavitt discovered that the periods of Cepheids are very closely related to their luminosities. The longer the period, the more luminous the star. We say that Cepheids obey a period luminosity relation. If we plot the luminosity versus period of many Cepheids, we would see this linear relationship. A Cepheid with a long period has a greater luminosity than a Cepheid with a short period. Once we measure the period of a Cepheid, we know its luminosity and we can use the inverse square law to determine distance. The Hubble Space Telescope has measured distances of galaxies up to 100 million light years away using Cepheid variable stars. That's far, certainly, but we want to measure the distance to galaxies billions of light years away. Thankfully, there's an even brighter standard candle for us to use, white dwarf supernovae. Remember, white dwarf supernovae occur when a white dwarf reaches the 1.4 solar mass limit. Since every white dwarf supernova explodes in the same way, the luminosities of the explosions are all the same. We can measure the apparent brightness and use the known luminosity to calculate the distance with the inverse square law for light. White dwarf supernovae can give us distances up to 10 billion light years. The only problem is that white dwarf supernovae occur only once every few hundred years in a typical galaxy, so you have to be lucky to see one. The ability to measure distances to galaxies really did change our view of the universe. Even up to the 1920s, astronomers weren't certain whether other galaxies existed beyond the Milky Way. By the early 1900s, telescopes could see faint nebulae, but were not powerful enough to make out individual stars. The big question was, were these nebulae part of the Milky Way, or were they distant islands of stars? There was a debate, literally, on this issue. On April 26, 1920, in Washington, D.C., the National Academy of Sciences sponsored what has since become known in astronomical circles as the Great Debate. It was Harlow Shapley versus Heber Curtis. Shapley argued that all the spiral nebulae visible were actually gas clouds within the Milky Way. Curtis argued that the nebulae were separate and distinct islands of stars. Neither astronomer had direct distance measurements. They instead made arguments based on what observations were available. Ultimately, there was no clear winner of the debate, as both men failed to make a convincing argument. In 1917, a young astronomer named Edwin Hubble was finishing graduate school. He was invited to join the staff at the prestigious Mount Wilson Observatory in Pasadena, California. The observatory had just completed construction of a 100-inch telescope, the world's largest at the time. Hubble delayed accepting the position for two years so that he could serve in World War I. But once at Mount Wilson, Hubble began observing the spiral nebulae that were the source of so much angst in the astronomical community. With the 100-inch telescope, he could actually resolve individual stars in the Andromeda spiral, suggesting that it was indeed a separate galaxy. Even better was when he could make out Cepheid variables in Andromeda. He used Henrietta Leavitt's period luminosity relation to estimate the luminosities of the Cepheids, and from that he was able to measure the distance to the Andromeda galaxy. And although Hubble underestimated the true distance by about half, he still found that Andromeda was far beyond the Milky Way. The Andromeda Nebula was, in fact, a separate galaxy. 
This marked the beginning of a paradigm shift in how we viewed the universe. With this measurement, we learned that our Milky Way is one among many islands of stars in a vast cosmic ocean. Hubble's Andromeda Galaxy distance measurement set the stage for an even greater discovery. Hubble continued to measure the distances to other galaxies and in the process found something very interesting. Astronomers knew that most of the galaxies were red shifted, therefore they must be moving away from us. Hubble found that the farther away a galaxy, the greater its redshift. Here is Hubble's plot of velocity versus distance. Each circle represents a galaxy. We can see what Hubble saw. The more distant the galaxy, the faster it's moving away from us. This is a newer plot of velocity versus distance. Basically, we have a straight line, and you may recall from some math class long ago that there is an equation for a line, usually written as y equals mx plus b. The y in this case is velocity, m is our slope, and x is distance. The y-intercept b is zero. Since this is a special plot, we'll give the slope a special name. We'll call it Hubble's constant, h naught. The equation of our line, velocity equals h naught times distance, is known as Hubble's law. You may recall that the slope of the line is rise over run. In this case, the rise is the change in velocity, and the run is the change in distance. This means the slope, h naught, is in units of velocity over distance. Here the units are kilometers per second per million light years. We can use Hubble's law to estimate the distance to other galaxies. All we need to do is measure the recessional velocity using the Doppler technique. The distance is the velocity divided by Hubble's constant. There are a couple of issues though. First, galaxies do not obey Hubble's law perfectly. Nearly all galaxies experience gravitational tugs from other galaxies, and those tugs will cause the speed to differ from what is predicted by Hubble's law. The distance calculation will be a bit off for such galaxies. Second, the distances calculated are only as accurate as our best measurement of the Hubble constant. One of the main missions of the Hubble Space Telescope has been to obtain an accurate value of the Hubble constant h naught. Hubble has used Cepheid variables in galaxies out to about 100 million light years to measure distances and recessional velocities. There are other techniques, and currently the accepted value for the Hubble constant is between 21 and 23 kilometers per second per million light years. We covered a ton today, so take a break, get a mocha or a chai tea. We'll come back to Hubble's Law next time, and we'll see what it implies about the origin and fate of our universe.